it's a privilege to be here this morning. And I remember uh, when we were back in the shepherd school, first shepherd school we ever had, and Pastor Chuck invited us to come. Probably was about seven of us. And I remember Stonebreaker and Jeff, myself, and Jimmy Kemner, and just a, a lot of other guys that were there. And probably that was my seminary that I received. I was never the same. When I went back home that week, I was totally changed because of what was shared by all the teachers that share at the Shepherd School. It was a one-week seminary, and it was just incredible to hear, to see what God wanted me to do. I remember going back home, and uh, every four times a week, I would drive from Covina all the way to the, uh, Orange County, 45 miles up, 45 miles back, 90, 90 miles every time I went to Calvary Chapel to learn to see what God intended to do in my personal life. And Chuck gave us so much as we served in that board for about 40-some years. And uh, it was a time that God spoke to him to, to bring about Jeff, uh, Stonebreaker, and Mike McIntosh, and Steve Mace, and uh, just these guys that not only God had called, but loved Chuck, and that we trusted Chuck. And we knew that he was going to lead us and guide us in teaching God's word. I taught many times here, and uh, Karen and their family have been a real blessing in our life for my wife and our blessing in our lives. And it's been neat to see what God has done in this church. And at the same time, I think Karen has come to a place in her life where her love has been taken from her. But we know that Jeff is in a better place in this conference. You know, he's in heaven waiting for me. I'm next probably. And, <laughs> and uh, it's just neat to see what God has done. There. And I pray that at this conference that every one of us will be touched by the Holy Spirit. I always tell on my services, you know, when you came here, please leave different. Don't leave the same way you came here. Make sure you leave here completely different. And I think that for those of you that are here, that uh, have come, pastors, assistants, whatever. I just feel that God not only wants me to share this with you, but for you, if you're in sin, to get out of sin. If you're going to be a pastor. If you're going to be a helper. Because we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And it's really a time where God has called us to teach the word of God. Let me tell you a little story that uh, this young man was in the library and he was looking for a book. And so the librarian said, well, the book's uh, in shelves, so-and-so, you go pick it up. So he went back to, to look for it. He couldn't find it. So he went back and said, you know what? You told me I can't find it. It's there. So she went back with him and they're looking through all the books and all of a sudden they see this book on top of the shelf. So she gets us to, she gets up there and all kinds of dust fall over. And to me, that's what happens to people that are disqualified from service. You become a book on the shelf. Cannot be read. The God can't use you. And I hope that at this conference, you will be a book that is readable when you go back to your church. And I think that God not only has done a work in my life, but it's been a real hard road 50-some years. But I thank God for the foundation I received from Pastor Chick Smith. And I remember Jeff, myself in that shepherd school, meeting for the first time and becoming great friends, great, great friends. It was very hard for me to hear that he passed away. And my wife, we love them. We love this family. And I know that God's going to use this family in a greater way because they are totally sold out to the Lord. And I'm hoping that each one of us individually will be sold out to the Lord. That God not only speaks to us, that God leads us, guides us, 
And the people would be able to see my life, your life. And when you look back in your life, you can see that God led you. That you made a difference in so many people's lives. Not to follow you, but to follow Jesus. A lot of times it's very hard because as pastors, we start out little and then we become big. And I think we have to be careful that Satan loves to do that. He loves to disqualify people. We forget that it's Christ's church, not our church. That he's the one that called you. He's the one that set you up. He's the one that put you in the pulpit. He's the one that can take you down. Believe it or not. And I've seen so many in Calvary Chapel be put down. Great teachers. Great, great teachers. And yet the Lord took them down because of the lifestyles they had. So what I want to do this morning, I want you to go to the book First Timothy, chapter 4, verse 6 to 16. You know, what kind of a person does God use to work in his kingdom? I think that's a great question to ask, not only for myself, but for you. Did God use this? Not only gifted men or smart men, he uses servants. Servants. A service always not only listening to his master, but that servant doesn't really have excuses why he's serving. And when I think of that servant that God calls, that people will be able to see your servanthood. I say, Pastor. As a leader, that the Holy Spirit will baptize you with his power, and that that power will last in your life. We don't want to be like Saul. That Saul was not chosen by God, he was chosen by the people. And in his ministry, he came to that place in his life that he wasn't listening in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, you know the story. From that point on, Saul became not a real man of God, but he lied, he cheated, and did not have the Spirit of God to minister. It's so sad that he went to a witch to ask for counsel because God was no longer speaking to him. And I know that each one of us individually, as we pursue the Lord, we want to hear from the Lord. That we have an ear to hear what the Holy Spirit says to the church. We are the church. The church of God. As I was reading the scripture, I was not only thinking of myself, but that God uses ordinary people like you, Myself. I'm reading from the news, actually from the Living Bible. I thought it was pretty good what it said. He says this in beginning with verse 6 in 1 Timothy 4. He says, if you explain this to the brothers and sisters, you will be doing your duty as worthy servant of Christ Jesus. One who is fed by the message of faith and be true teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas or old wise tales. Spend your time and energy in training yourself for spiritual fitness. Physical exercise has some value, but spiritual exercise is much more important for it promises a reward in both this life and the life to come. This is true, and everyone should accept it. We work hard. We suffer much in order that people will believe the truth. For our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of those who believe. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you teach, in the way you live, in your love, in your faith, in your purity, until you get their focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teach them. Do not neglect the spiritual gift 
you received through the prophecy spoken to you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into the task so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right, and God will save you and those who hear you. I thought it was pretty amazing the, the way Paul writes to Timothy. But I think we have a lot of Timothys here this morning. And I think we have a lot of Pauls here this morning. And you have to stand back and you have to look at your own personal life. The Pastor Chuck not only was a great teacher, but he was really a father to us. He cared for his children. And if you're a pastor, you got to care for your children. Because remember, when they come to church, they don't know much. They're coming to receive something. They have problems at home. Whatever they're going through, they sit on the teaching. And then a lot of churches, they entertain. They don't teach. And the church should not entertain. They should teach the word of God without any compromise. People want to hear a message by the Holy Spirit. When you pray, when you study, I tell people all the time, when I'm at home reading, studying, and when God speaks to me, God will speak through me to people. But if you don't study, who can he speak to? I don't think he can speak to anybody. I don't know where you are today, but I know that God's in control. I think Paul was very clear about a calling. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 27, he says, For you see your calling, brethren, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not noble and called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. He uses anyone that is in submission to him. He wants obedience in the kingdom of God. He wants you as a leader to be obedient, not to men, but to him. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. And many times we want to convince people that we're sacrificing much and we're not being obedient. Over the last 50 years, and probably you know, people that are here, they've been in Calvary Chapel a long time. And we've seen so many people say they're obedient. And Pastor Chuck, you know, called us and said something about that person that has a church. And we've gotten out a lot. Like, for example, there was a church in Chicago that Pastor Chuck called me to go out with somebody else. The pastor was... During the weekend, on Friday night, he would smoke marijuana. On Saturdays, he would drink his beer. And on Sunday morning, he would preach. No fear of God. I don't know what your Sunday mornings are like. And I don't know how your life is. But I hope you have the fear of God. Did you have the fear of God? God will judge. And when he judges... He's not against you, but he judges you because he's going to spank you. And it could be a light spanking or it could be a heavy spanking. And that's why Hebrews was right, wrote in chapter 12. And I think that as I was reading, that Jesus works through people, through their lives, so that God gets the glory. Glory doesn't belong to you or me. It belongs to God. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 10, By grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, his poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them, should walk in them. It is important that we take time to pray, time to read, time to study God's word so that we can feed God's people. It's also important that we wait for our spiritual feeding as a pastor, as a leader. 
so that we can grow. If you're not growing in the spirit, you're not growing in the word of God, what can you give to people? What can you give to people? When they taste, do they taste God or they taste you? Many times we can get to a place because God bless us, we get a big head. And we've seen many of those in the church. I think the Bible talks about humility. Humility is very important because you don't have to say I'm humble. You can't say I'm humble. The Lord, people will see that you are humble because God brought you to that place. You're not boasting. You're thanking God for using a donkey that God can use. And believe me, I know about that in my own personal life. It is important to take time not only to pray, but David's word concerning God's word, he said in Psalm 1997, he said, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. You know, there are many leaders that don't read or study God's word. You know, if you don't read, you don't study, what can you give to people? And I said that before, I'm repeating it once again. You may think you have God's word, but it might be your own words. In our own words, when there's a great wind, they fly away. They don't pierce people's hearts. They don't change people's hearts. Because you need to be changed yourself before you take the word of God to somebody else. I found that a lot of emotionalism will never feed your spirituality. It will only feed your soul, not your spirit. We need to feed on God's word daily. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, as newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby that we may grow, develop spiritually. So when people look at our lives, they don't see something that is not growing and developing spiritually. But they see someone that is dying spiritually. No fruit. And Jesus was very clear in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. He said, a person that doesn't bring forth fruit, he does what? He does trimming. He takes those dry stems, and what does he do? He throws them into the fire. Into the fire. I think a lot of people are going to be surprised in eternity. But they thought they were right on. They thought they were moving forward. But what happens if you're drinking? If you're in adultery? If you're lying? And taking advantage of people, you will not see heaven. I'm sorry. You will not see heaven. Jesus said, be you holy for I am holy. And you don't have to tell people you're holy. People will see the holiness of God in your life. So when I read the scriptures, I believe the scriptures. That God spoke to the apostles. And the Lord gave authority to them to speak the word of God. Because we have Satan that attacks us. That wants to deceive us. In Matthew chapter 4, I'm, through, I'm going through the book of Matthew right now. In you know, chapter 4, you know, Satan came and tempted Jesus physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In chapter 4, verse, excuse me, verse 4, he says, But he answered and said to Satan, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word of God. The word of God. The word of God. Important, feeding upon God's word. That God would see that we're developing, we're growing. That's a priority in my life. Job tells us how important God's word is in his own life. In Job 23, 12, he said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than necessary food. More than necessary food. Some of you are feeding four times a day. Five times a day, you need to feed upon God's word. Don't feed the physical, feed the spiritual. Job said that God's word is more important and necessary 
to some people or leaders feeding on God's word is boring. But to others, it is a delight to feed upon word daily. Day daily. We can live apart from the word of God and expect wise to be strong. You can't do that. There are many leaders that are starving to death spiritually because they don't really feed upon God's word. Feeding upon God's word as leaders will give us wisdom to make decisions for the ministry and for the people God has given. They're not your people. This is not your church. It's God's church. He's loaned you the church. And he expects a great return in the kingdom of God. It's not about people. It's about what? The word of God. People being fed God's word so they're convicted and they can become a help to the church, not a problem to the church. Clarence McCurney said, but the word of God is not bound. That is the inscription of a pillar is the crypt of a church in Rome where Paul is said to have been in prison. How true that statement of the apostle was and is demonstrated by the simple yet tremendous fact that the 1900 years after Peter wrote from prison in Rome, the word of God is not bound. The words are taken in the next for a sermon on the invincible power of the Bible. Second Timothy chapter two, verse nine, for which I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not changed, not changed. God's word brings and gives us his will. He gives us great defense against Satan and his demons. Paul himself exhorts to defend ourselves completely by the word of God. When you study God's word, Satan is going to be to do everything in his power to distract you, to get you not to read and to pray. And surely we've all experienced that. We're not perfect. But I know that when I give my life to Christ, I don't want to play games. I don't play games with God. I mean what I say. And I do what I have to do. I remember Satan not only have no power or lights, but he asked for permission. And he asked for permission. And he asked us for permission. The problem is, will you give to it? Or are you going to rebuke it by the word of God? Paul the Apostle warns us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18, the armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to sin against the wiles of the devil or the schemes. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, in blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having geared your ways with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and to take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and puts all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end, 
with all perseverance, supplication for all the saints. When I read that, I don't take it lightly. I remember how many of my friends got killed in Vietnam. And I had to grow up to be a brother to them and them brothers to me. The saddest scene was taken up. Those that were wounded, those that were dead, those that were in pieces. And when I came to Christ, I wanted to be a warrior for Christ. A warrior for Christ. A warrior for Christ. That I want to make sure that I put on the armor of God. Not forgetting that God has made me a leader, a husband, grandchildren, sons. And there are times that as Christians, we face many, many trials that sometimes we feel that we're not going to make it. That with all things, Christ is there for us. We don't want to forget as leader to put on the whole armor of God and to get the victory over Satan. Over Satan. Satan has no power over our lives. I don't serve Satan. I serve Jesus. My master, my Lord, the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. And if you don't know him, you need to know him personally. Not just because you're a leader. Not just because you're on the radio. Or you're on TV. Or you have a big church. It doesn't really matter. God sees people's hearts. And God sees our attitudes. Without him, I can do nothing in my life. I use his word as my defense. Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The heart is deceitful, that's really wicked. As we study, teach God's word, before it can convict someone, it has to convict me. I have to look at my life. I don't want to be a hypocrite, an actor. One that goes into the pulpit and acts. One that acts like everything's cool. And we want to be like everything else, like everyone else. The screens, the worship, all those things that we never had when we got saved. I have screens, but I don't worship my screens. And I don't worship my music, because it's not my music. It's the Lord's. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 3, he says, then we read from it in the open square, speaking of God's word, was in front of the water gate. From morning until the midday, before the men and women, those who could understand, the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, Psalm 1, 2. In his law, he meditates day and night. You know what I see? Something that bothers me. Is that we have phones, we have iPads, and we have computers and we spend more time in those electronics than we spend more time on our knees we can go in the inner copy sermons but is God really speaking to you 
where that sermon is going to bring conviction to me and conviction to the people. Because if it doesn't, get a job. Get a job. Don't take God's people's money. There's a lot of these young pastors that are buying houses, buying cars, and they don't even have a church. And then the people are the last. When the people should be the first. If you have to hitchhike like I did when I got to church, I hitchhiked. I didn't have a car. Two years. Did I complain? No, I gave my car to my wife and my kids. Salaries. All these things that the word of God speaks to us and warns us if you want to be a leader then lead yourself. If God leads you and you can lead others, as God will give you the wisdom. Wester, Wester, actually Daniel says in the Western Dictionary, the Bible is a book of faith and a book of doctrine, and a book of morals, and a book of religion, a special revelation from God, but it also is a book which teaches men his own individual responsibility, his own dignity, and his equality with his fellow men. John Bunyan said, this book will keep her from sin, but sin will keep her from this book. I don't know where you stand in the kingdom of God. But at this conference, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Please don't be a hypocrite. Be honest with God. And if you're living a life of sin, shame on you. You need to repent. And when you leave here, don't go back like the dog going back to his own vomit. Like the swine going back to the mud. Because the Lord loves you, He cares for you, and He will not put up with sin. Father, I thank you so much for your grace, for your love, and for your mercies. And Lord, we pray for this conference, Lord God, that it would be an amazing conference for people to live here worshiping you and thanking you, Lord God, for what you've done in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen.